You are listening to the Heartland Author Podcast. I am Aaron Apollo Camp. For the third to last episode of this podcast under its current name, I had the opportunity to interview J.P. Lind. J.P. is an author, comedian, and scriptwriter. J.P. has written three books, The Holographic Detective Agency, Son of Ravage, and Fool's Gold, with a fourth book, The Lost Argonaut, slated to be released next year. I'm here with J.P. Lind, who is an author, comedian, uh, and a script writer. J.P., welcome to the Heartland Author Podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. Sure. So uh, <clears throat> my name is J.P. Lindy. I uh, um, uh, am an actor, started out as an actor in college, moved to stand-up comedy, <clears throat> went on to write, and then uh, became a screenwriter, uh, and now a novelist. So uh, I've been doing it for um, about 20 years, and uh, I'm just kind of getting serious about the writing part of it, and really enjoying the journey. I think the process is um, so rewarding. And uh, uh, so that's pretty much about me. I, I did uh, uh, a national... Uh, televised uh, Showtime special uh, as a comedian, which is available on my website. You can just uh, go to jplindy.com and click on the little picture of me performing and you can see a little uh, snippet from my act. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of my uh, history right there. You've written three books that have been published so far. The Holographic Detective Agency, Son of Ravage, and Fool's Gold. Without spoiling too much of those books, what are each of them about? Well, <clears throat> the Holographic Detective Agency is uh, basically a uh, kind of a homage to uh, Sam Spade in the technological era. So it's about a detective kind of a recluse who uses holograms of uh, famous people to help solve crimes. Um, so he may use in, in, in one scene to get some information from the enemy, he may use a hologram of Dean Martin. In another one, he might use a hologram of uh, Circus Dole. Um, in another one, he might use a hologram of Mark Twain. Uh, when we first meet him, he's <clears throat> watching a, uh, uh, a film with uh, Howard Hughes, uh, Ice Station Zebra. So he just kind of uses technology to kind of uh, help him solve a crime when a uh, old flame comes to visit and uh, asks him to help find her husband. So that's the first one. Son of Ravage is kind of a labor of love. When I was in college, uh, some friends of mine and I became obsessed with Doc Savage, the pulp uh, character of the 30s. And I always wondered what it would be like if... Um, Doc Savage had a kind of ne'er-do-well, illegitimate son who at some point in his adult life was forced to pick up the mantle and, and take up after his uh, dad. Um, unfortunately, uh, Condé Nast owns Doc Savage and wouldn't kind of free up the name. So Doc Savage became the Ravager, another kind of pulp type uh, hero. And um, that's what that story is about. Uh, it's it very much in the framework of an old Doc Savage story. So he's got uh, four associates, um, each one kind of a specialist in their own field. And it's a lot of fun. It's kind of a tour de farce and a homage to the, the Doc Savage stories. The last one, Fool's Gold, is the one I'm most proud of. And that, of course, is um, based on the real life meeting of Wyatt Earp and Jack London. Uh, historically, the two did meet. <clears throat> historically, the two uh, were uh, uh, going to join forces to interview Pancho Villa. And I and I kind of came up with an idea of, well, how did they meet? Were they adversaries at first? And that's how the, that's how that story kind of uh, germinated. And that story has been around. That actually started out as a screenplay treatment back in the 90s. And uh, my manager just recently during the writer strike kind of talked me into you know, turning it into a, a novel, as it were. So that's how that one came to be. Now, uh, you've cited a person by the name of Tom McComb as being very influential in helping you write Fool's Gold. Who is Tom McComb and how did he help you in writing Fool's Gold? 
That's a great question. Tom McComb uh, is one of my best friends. And uh, Tom McComb and I started a uh, improvisational sketch comedy group back in the 80s called No Prisoners. And it, at one time, it was kind of a big deal in, in, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Tom and I always bounced ideas off of each other. And when I came up with the treatment for Fool's Gold, he was the one who said, you know, you've got a story here. This is really something that I would, you know, that I would want to see as a movie and something I would like to read as a book. So Tom and I kind of continue that relationship all the way through uh, adulthood. Tom passed away uh, a couple of years ago, but um, that's kind of the story of that. And interestingly, you should mention Tom because Tom is a character in Son of Ravage. He's actually the doc character in there. Um, and he will show up in a lot of my screenplays and uh, and a lot of my books as a as a as some sort of character in it because he was so influential in me and my in my creative career. You mentioned that Fool's Gold, your novel, uh, an ad a novel adaptation of uh, a, a screenplay that you wrote. Uh, what work did you have to do to adapt the Fool's Gold screenplay to uh, the novel book format? Um, you know, they're they're really two different animals, and uh, it in a in a in a novel, I think you really you have time to flesh out um, certain aspects of of uh, the characters. You can tell a little bit more of their backstory. You can add scenes that help kind of move the story along. So what I did was I took the basic structure of the screenplay as an outline, and then I added to that. For example, the uh, Bolshevik uh, whaling vessel um, that the uh, Jack London and and the boy find themselves um, uh, taken up taken on is is added. Uh, another scene where they're in the lifeboat with the um, uh, killer whale and the uh, great white shark that's also was added uh the scene of a uh, white herb and meeting uh the femme fatale nicole on the train those were added all of those flesh out the character and it, it's really really important in a novel you have a little breathing room you you can just really really kind of explain your characters and there's a in the screenplay um the uh, secret gold mine is marked by uh, a frozen dead body and uh, it's kind of the last marker that you know that you're on your right right path to the, the treasure. And in the novel, I was able to explain who that body was, how he got there, um, uh, what happened to him, his relationship to the old prospector, Charlie. Um, all of those things were were explained in the in the novel where they were just reference points in the in the movie where it's it's talked about, but it really isn't fleshed out. Um, there's another scene with Nicole where we talk about her as a child, uh, which kind of illuminates uh, her as, an, as a as a as a woman and why she is the way she is. So there were a lot of there was a lot of basically fleshing out, which was a lot of a lot of fun to do, and um, I, I really enjoyed it. it. It just it just it just it's more creative, fulfilling to be able to go into little tangents and and um, explore things a little more thoroughly. And those were some of the fun points that I had with working on the novel. You have a fourth book that's going to be published in 2024, if I'm not mistaken, and it's called The Last Argonaut. Without spoiling too much of it, what will that book be about? Um, well, that's from our, our friends at Prose Press. Um, I've I've done uh, a short story for them, The Purple Zombie, and then pitched this idea to them. It's based on a on a um, kind of a '30s pulp hero called the Peregrine, <clears throat> and uh, he's he's a little bit like Doc Savage, but he wears a mask. He's kind of a cross between Green Hornet and uh, uh, Doc Savage. Um, he works alone. Sometimes he works with his wife. But the but the last argonaut was something that I wanted to explore. I'm I'm really fascinated by Greek mythology, and I wanted to tell a kind of semi modern story of a modern hero looking for the golden fleece. Um, in this particular story, uh, Hitler happens to be looking for it too, uh, because he thinks that if he has the golden fleece, he can win World War II. 
Um, the Peregrine has been sent by uh, uh, Washington, by J. Edgar Hoover, to find the Golden Fleece first. And uh, on the way, he meets a Russian superhero called the Red Scare, and they and the two are kind of first adversaries, and finally they work together in order to um, find it. But it just it just kind of explored the whole uh, Greek mythology thing. So I was able to add a lot of Greek characters into it. Uh, Medusa, um, uh, some who are some of the others. The um, uh, sirens are in it. There, there's. Uh, I think we have the Kraken in it and briefly. Um, so it was just kind of a lot of fun. And, and I love Indiana Jones and I love that kind of, I, I, I think you can always blame the Nazis on anything. They always make such a great villain. So that's how, you know, uh, that's kind of how that story germinated. Um, but that's, yeah, that's coming out in uh, 24. And I'm really looking forward to that one. I'm kind of, because they, they do some kind of crazy artwork with it and it, it should be a lot of fun for all those listeners that, you know, love the, the kind of pulp genre as much as I do. That will be a lot of fun. Are all your books self-published, traditionally published or published by a hybrid press, or did you use a mix of publishing types for your books? I used the, fir the first three were all self-published. They're published under the the uh, 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 the fake publishing company of El Dorado Publishing Company, which is a uh, company in the Son of Ravage stories. Um, Prose Press is actually a, a legitimate uh, publisher, and they'll be publishing the last one. Um, my books are generally uh, made to increase the IP of that particular project. And when I say that, of course, it's very, very important that they sell. And that's why I'm doing this podcast to get listeners, you know, hopefully excited enough to read the books. But what they, what they, what they, the real purpose is, is to increase the value of the property to, um, for producers to see, oh, look, uh, Fool's Gold, for example, got uh, 30 great reviews on Amazon and on Goodreads, it got, you know, uh, 60 great reviews. And what that does is it it gets a, a producer's attention so that they'll read the book and maybe uh, option a script off of it or some other kind of thing. So it's a, you know, I write for two reasons. One's because I love to. And second of all is to improve the, you know, the IP of, of my portfolio. If you have a writing routine, what is that like for you? Um, I write every day, uh, seven days a week. Um, I, I generally get up. First thing I do is I write. I write for two hours, take a walk, uh, usually about a mile and a half, two miles, get back and write some more. Every single day, even on holidays, I write. Um, usually I don't set a limit on the on the words I write, but it's roughly you know, between 700 and 1,000 words. Um, generally, when I'm on a deadline, I tend to you know increase that. Um, I generally tend to write uh, on two or three things at once. And this is something I learned in the, in the uh, uh, movie trade is that you uh, put all your projects up on a whiteboard and then you prioritize them as to what is due. For example, uh, fool's gold was, was due the first. So we work on that. I'm working on a Christmas script right now. So that's what I work secondary. And then um, anything else that I might be, working on but i'm always working on about three projects at a time um what authors have influenced your writing uh you know i have a <clears throat> i have a ton of authors I, I i think my favorite author has to be john steinbeck and i know that every writer in the world always answers him but um i just think that nobody gets to the human condition better than steinbeck does um i'm a i'm a uh, I was a comedian for a long time. So obviously uh, Mark Twain is a huge influence. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, I love William Goldman as far as uh, The Princess Bride happens to be one of my favorite books. I think it's a terrific movie, but I think as a book, it's uh, fantastic. Um, I think every writer needs to be reading constantly. <clears throat> and uh, that's something that I, you know, that I like to do. So there, there are plenty of authors that inspire me to um, uh, keep going, you know. 
you were a founder of the uh, Portland, Oregon comedy scene and appeared on Showtime's uh, Comedy Club Network program. What was the comedy scene in Portland like in the days you were a part of it? And were there any comedians that influenced your style of comedy? Well, that's a great question. Um, uh, well, this was... I started in comedy when uh, when it first started getting very, very popular. The comics that were really, really popular and that kind of started comedy up, uh, the main one was Robin Williams. Billy Crystal was really, really popular. Um, Gary Shandling was popular. Um, but all of those were really, really um, uh, influential. For myself personally, um, the comics that I really, really enjoyed were Robin Williams, uh, Billy Crystal on Saturday Night Live. I loved him. Monty Python was a huge influence um, from uh, my sketch comedy days. I mean, I just loved the way they did that. Second City, Eugene Levy, um, the characters, John Candy, um, from all of those. Those were all really, really influential to me. Um, Second City and Saturday Night Live was kind of why I started the No Prisoners comedy group where I met Tom McComb. Um, there, there's, just, there's just so many, so many good comics. And then then it really, really took off. And I, and I came to a point where I went, what do I, what do I really want to do? Do I want to stand up on stage and be funny or do I want to write and, and maybe entertain people that way? And that's why I kind of veered off over into the writing career. Is I just wanted to be more of a writer. Um, it takes a lot to get up on stage. It really, it, it really, really does. When people say it's one of the toughest things in the world, it really is one of the toughest things in the world because you have no idea of how you know an audience is going to react. And it's intermediate. As soon as you get up there, you know, you know whether it's going to go well or not. So it's uh um it's it's really a risk, and there's so many good people at it, so many people much better than I am. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad I did it, but I'm also glad that now I can sit in an audience and watch it. You co-wrote the horror movie At the Grind, which uh, uh, I think was a a B uh, a horror B movie, if I recall correctly. You you have it right. It was. I mean, I I think it's a, a C D E or F movie. Um, Axe to Grind was written uh, or directed by a friend of mine named uh, Matt Sattel. Uh, he's a great, he's a great director. And he was, um, he was hired on this project to write, to uh, direct a script. Uh, and he didn't feel like the script was up to snuff. So he hired me to rewrite it. And I had one week and this, we're talking about a page one rewrite, which means every, everything from page one to page 100, is is rewritten basically so um turned it in in a week um turned it all into an interior kind of a mental hospital and shot it they shot it i think in 10 days and uh um <laughs> you know it it was fun it was really really exciting and fun now if you look at the credits you'll see that uh uh my first credit is associate producer and my second credit is additional dialogue by because the the main writer was not too fond of me um, uh, taking credit, screen credit, and he was also the man who put up the money for the film. So I've got an additional dialogue and associate producer credit, but it was a lot of fun. And from that, I actually wrote another horror film that never got produced called um, uh, The Lighthouse Keeper, which I think is far superior. And that was for Suzanne De Laurentiis, uh, Dino's cousin. And, and that was a lot of fun. And that was like, a, um, I had more time and, and it was a lot of fun and, and really, really enjoyed it. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was great fun. You know, uh, I met a lot of great people on it. Uh, and uh, that was, the, that was a film that got, kind of launched, launched my film career, really. You've been, excuse me. You've been a novel writer, movie script writer, comedian, and I believe you've also been a theater actor and a musical playwright as well. Is there anything in common that has drawn you into so many different creative fields? 
You know, um, uh, boy, that's a really great question. I, I think they all have writing in common. I, I, you know, I really do. A stand-up comedian writes his own routine. I think uh, um, uh, a even an actor on stage um, uh, will sometimes write his own backstory of that character. Um, there's always that's always common the common thread. And I knew when I was a kid in grade school that I wanted to be a writer. I mean, I would write the, the uh, class plays um, and it was something that I always really wanted to do. And I really believe this. And if there, I, I think there are a lot of writers listening to your podcast, since it's such a good podcast. I really believe that the, the key is to keep going, to keep writing every day. Don't, don't worry about what people tell you that you just sit down and you continue to write um, and uh, you will get better. Uh, the first things that I ever wrote, I think are, are pretty atrocious. And I've, you know, you mentioned the three novels that I've written. I've actually written probably five or six, but of those five or six, only three are worth really, you know, getting out there to the public. But I continue and I keep doing it. And uh, it's something that I just really, really love. There's a great motivational video uh, by Anthony Hopkins, which anybody can get on YouTube. It's called Believe. And all he does is just say, you know, believe, believe you can do it, believe it, believe it, you know. And I honestly believe that that's how you can kind of succeed in this business is if no one else believes in you, but you do, I think you've got a really good shot of, you know, getting your stuff out there and just keep working, man. I really, really believe it. JP Lindy, I thank you for appearing on the Heartland Author Podcast and you were a very insightful guest. Well, listen, I'm a big fan of your work. Keep up the good work. Um, there are a lot of writers who listen to this podcast they get their inspiration from the writers you have uh one of my favorite episodes was the episode that you had where you interviewed two uh, authors the the gentlemen who do the um, tom clancy kind of spinoff character that was a great interview my friend yeah that was andrews and wilson yeah that was a great interview and that was inspirational right there so keep up the good work i'm a big fan JP was a fantastic guest for this podcast. This is Aaron Apollo Camp reminding y'all to write your imagination. Bye for now. You can learn more about me and my book writing projects at camparenapollo.witsite.com forward slash author AAC. You can follow me on Facebook at author AAC and on Instagram at AAC Scribe. Copyright 2023, Aaron Apollo Camp, All Rights Reserved. This podcast episode is intended for the private listening of our audience. Any reuse or retransmission of this podcast episode without the express written consent of the podcast host is prohibited, except under fair use guidelines. Royalty free music and sound effects obtained from https colon forward slash forward slash www.zapsplat.com.